List week, list week, list week, list week. Hi everyone, list the week, week Tano, Tano here, the internet's busiest music nerd, and it's time for the latest installment of uh, List Week, compiling the best and the worst that 2023 had to offer. In this instance, it is the worst albums of the year. I have 10 of them here for you, and may God have mercy on your soul. So uh, yeah, let's start with number 10. That would be the Macklemore album, Ben. Rapper, songwriter, Macklemore. Came back. New album. Uh, named after his, his, own, his own name. It's been years since he dropped, and, uh, you know, it, I had to wonder, what does Macklemore have to say after all these years? Why would he come through uh, after all this time? And after listening to this record multiple times and reviewing it, I, I still don't really have an answer to that question. I guess his reason was to drop another batch of uh, overly sentimental, mediocre piano rap songs combined with some tracks that are just so cringe and tongue-in-cheek and just too silly for words. On top of that, some other tracks where uh, he's clearly ripping off some other style of music or some other artist's sound, uh, Future Islands most notably, and just playing into something that is clearly not his strong suit, but uh, yeah, he's, he's just doing it anyway. While Ben was not the worst thing I've ever heard, and certainly not the worst album I heard this year, also there was really nothing good about it which is why it landed at number 10 on this list. I also struggled to find the good in the record in this number nine spot here. Uh, that would be the World's End Girlfriend album, The Resistance and the Blessing. Japanese experimental rock and multi-genre music project, World's End Girlfriend. The brainchild of producer, composer, and songwriter Katsuhiko Maida, uh, this project was at one point at the forefront of post-rock with daring, glitchy electronic production and to say the least, since then, things have kind of devolved into the record you see here before you. Two and a half hours of these jarring, abrasive, hideous fusions of classical music, walls of noise, sound collage, pop, elevator jazz, ambient music, and drone two, and absolutely none of it comes together cohesively or sensibly. The genres being portrayed and reimagined here aren't even really done so all that artfully. I kind of feel like we're getting these surface level buffet quality servings of a bunch of different styles mashed together in the most ham-fisted and uh, hokey ways imaginable. Not to mention all the horrid, painful mixes across this record too. It's tedious, it's long-winded, it is over the top, and because none of it links together all that effectively, all of these highs and lows don't really feel like they add up to anything. In fact, as the record progresses, uh, the quality of the ideas kind of gets more outlandish and, frankly, uh, more torturous, as we eventually reach, like, this 10-minute rendition of Ave Maria that, honestly, is completely unlistenable. But, yeah, this record, in a word for me, Torture. Also, Torture is the album at our number eight spot, but uh, maybe a much uh, shorter instance of such. That would be the 6 9 album, uh, Leende Viva, where 6 9 generically hops onto one Latin pop track after another with bland production, uh, auto tune soaked vocals, some features that don't really stand out either. It's just this completely soulless, lifeless mess that uh, barely qualifies as music. And when I say barely qualifies as music. That's not to say uh, there's no melody, there's no beat, there's no groove. Uh, for sure there certainly is. Uh, by all conventional standards, I guess you could call this music. But maybe the most important and defining characteristic of any sort of uh, sonically organized art for me is the heart and the soul and the passion that goes into it. And in the case of 6 9 you can tell none of that, absolutely none of that is here. As he is phoning it in on every track, generating no distinct sounds or vocal performances whatsoever, and presumably trying to make a bit of a genre hop here uh, into something that could be lucrative for him, given that he is very much a pariah in the world of hip-hop right now. However, there's too much good Latin pop and reggaeton out there for this to uh, turn up on most people's radars, I think. So hopefully whatever he was attempting on this album blows up in his face and he just goes away. The man at number seven here, Lil Pump, also doesn't really know when to go away, as he has dropped his Lil Pump 2 project, what I guess is like the sequel 
sequel to his debut Lil Pump tape. A project that a lot of people still get up my ass today for saying is good and enjoyable and fun and entertaining and yeah, I still think that's what it is. It's a stupid and simple good time. Lord knows you guys like some mindless music. Why can't I have my fun in the sun? But look, even though I like that project, uh, Lil Pump has absolutely positively failed to come through with a record uh, that is anywhere near as visceral and as thrilling as that tape was. As I think he's tried to put out tracks that uh, have more of a pop appeal, cleaner production, are in a way maybe more measured, uh, maybe that wild, raw, youthful energy that he had when he initially came out of the gate, he just doesn't got it anymore. Now he's just like a shell of his former self and is playing more into a character uh, that he made for himself than just kind of like authentically maturing into a new and different person. While again, that debut Lil Pump tape I, I think is really fun, but as, as, as a person, you can't be that guy forever. Like you're going to evolve into something else, whether you want to or not. Even if you do desperately try to grasp onto it in the way that Lil Pump does. I would say that's especially the case for Lil Pump 2, where once again, he barely sounds enthused or engaged on his own tracks. So a lot of the time, this thing in one word, boring. There are a few moments where it's close, but no cigar in terms of recapturing that old energy. And then there's a bunch of other tracks here where he just embarks on these just trash outlandish song ideas. I like this one metal song that is <laughs> <laughs> I can't even get into how unintentionally funny this this track is. This thing is garbage, and it's not even entertaining garbage, and that's what's sad about it. Speaking of not entertaining, number six, AJR, The Maybe Man. Yep, we have a new album of music for Disney adults who swear. More bland, cutesy instrumentation that sounds like... Uh, theme songs to 2000s era cartoon shows over which you have boyish men singing about things that honestly they should be saving for their therapists. If putting these problems over mediocre songwriting uh, has not fixed them up until this point, why are you still doing it? Is it because you enjoy seeing the rest of us suffer? It must be. Not only does this album suck, but it continues to show a complete lack of progression or creativity on AJR's part, because at this point it just feels like the trio is writing the same fucking album over and over and over. It's like I'm trapped in a really lengthy Groundhog's Day paradox, and I feel like I'm making progress and life is changing, but oh, all of a sudden uh, there's the same fucking AJR album coming out again under a different title with different album art. Please, Mr. AJR, whatever your name is, uh, stop doing this. Stop, please. The next record at number five also made me want to beg for mercy. That is the new Destroy Lonely project, If Looks Could Kill, which all in all is pretty much another mediocre rage project uh, dropping via Playboy Cardi's Opium record label. The lyricism, non-existent. The vocal talent, non-existent. The flows, the sticky memorable flows, non-existent. Rich, melodic, memorable, tasteful, lush, dynamic production, non-existent. Character, personality, song structure, non-existent. Pretty much what Destroy Lonely delivers here is this uh, grating, slow, tedious, dull, slightly fuzzed out, psychedelic trap mess that isn't even that dark or trippy or anything. His sense of rhythm as a rapper and vocalist is not really all that strong, nor does his whispery and slightly raspy vocal delivery uh, stick out in the mix either, really putting on display how formulaic and uncreative this rage stuff is uh, at the moment, or it can be if you're not being adventurous with it. Hopefully the next Cardi album breathes some life into this stuff because this guy's not doing it. And oh, breathing new life. That's what number four is doing. Greta Van Fleet with uh, the Star Chaser. <laughs> I keep calling it that. It's Starcatcher. I'm pretty sure that's a sign of the fact that my brain really wants to reject this album. As soon as I listen to it and I have any kind of experience with it, I'm just like immediately... <laughs> erasing it and just like freeing up that space for something else most likely. I actually had to re-acclimate myself uh, to this record, uh, unlike with some of these other albums. But in coming back to it, I was kind of shocked actually. I couldn't believe not only does Greta Van Fleet just have no new ideas to offer on this album, but this also may be like their most shittily produced album uh, ever so far, as many of the tracks on this thing sound like uh, a horrendous live show where the guitar 
guitars and the drums are very loosely following each other a lot of the time. Meanwhile, their singer is uh, buried in the mix on some tracks, he's too loud on other tracks, and God, he is just wailing in what sounds like a giant and very empty concert hall. <laughs> Vocals, guitars, drums, bass. I can't believe how terribly the band <laughs> is treating these sounds on this record. And coming so close to aping and parroting the sounds of great and classic bands uh, such as Aerosmith and Led Zeppelin and, and Rush, but also falling so terribly short and resulting in this twisted, a torturous, bizarro version that makes me feel like maybe rock needs to die, or maybe it should just go on vacation. I need a vacation after the record on our number three spot, uh, which is also a little rock. That would be the Hardy album, The Mockingbird and The Crow, a double album from this once mostly country artist where he delivers a series of soulless, bland, uh, low personality, but sometimes slightly problematic and uh, socially annoying in terms of uh, their commentary country songs. And then around the midpoint of the record, there's like a little bit of a, a transitional moment. And this is when Hardy becomes like the crow. And then he starts busting into this shit kicking country rock a la Kid Rock. That's kind of badass, kind of alt metal, but still hella redneck. And that's when things truly go off the rails. And the album uh, not only starts overstaying its welcome, but just gets like four to five times worse uh, than the country part of it just prior. It kind of reminds me of like back in the day when Garth Brooks uh, revealed his like darker, moodier Chris Gaines uh, side uh, through that, you know, new persona, but like even worse, honestly. Except it barely even feels like a new or interesting persona to begin with, but whatever. Yeah, I have nothing nice to say about this record. I mean, it's so bad it's funny sometimes, which simultaneously is the nicest thing that can be said about the record at number two. That would be, uh, the sequel, The Brave 2, from Tom McDonald and Adam Calhoun. Yep, your favorite dumb, ignorant, right-wing white rappers are back with a sequel to their first shitty album, and surprise, surprise, it's also shitty. I can give Adam and Tom something, though. Somehow, they have managed to be more hateful, more annoying, and more patriotic than they ever were before, as they relentlessly spit bars about how America's lost its way, and this LGBTQ panic, uh, as well well as uh, Eminem, they can't shut the fuck up about Eminem. Oh, I'm Eminem if he wasn't if he wasn't liberal. I'd still be rapping if it wasn't f for Shady. Oh, I'm the greatest rapper since Eminem. Whoa. You probably already know this, but this record is basically if that guy who says, "Oh, I, I don't usually listen to hip hop, but but this over here, this." Yeah, this record is if that guy were a person. This album is your racist drunk uncle at Thanksgiving. This album should most definitely be questioned about where it was on Jan. And sixth. This album most definitely has a Let's Go Brandon sign on its front lawn. This album is most definitely on a government list or two, and you know what kind of list I'm talking about. This album is late on at least three child support payments, and I need to stop talking about it, so let's move on to number one. And honestly, that would be the Avenged Sevenfold album, Life is But a Dream, which I do truly think is the worst album of the year. But you know what? There's a silver lining to this cloud, because I feel like Avenged Sevenfold landed this number one spot because uh, they dared to do something different. They really experimented on this LP, they pulled out all the stops, they refused to let the sound and style and direction of their previous records define them, but it just so happens that every weird, random experiment or musical idea they employ on this album is horrendously bad and unintentionally hilarious. Like, going back to this record for this video, I was almost pissing myself laughing at some of the <laughs> weird guitar parts and terrible uh, vocal performances across the entire thing. Many of which sound like the band got really into Mr. Bungle, Mike Patton, and System of a Down for a very short period of time, and just like took away every wrong idea from their music that you possibly could. It's like all the zaniness, but 
none of the musical talent poured through. Not to mention the mixes and instrumentation on this album sound way, 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 way below in terms of quality what you should get from a band at uh, Avenge Sevenfold's level. And yeah, from end to end, this album to me just reads as uh, pure goofiness, while simultaneously being so deeply convinced of its own darkness, genius, and... Uh, 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 maybe avant-garde-ness? Yeah, it's kind of Baby's first experimental metal album in a way. And if you're not pulling that shit together all that well, that, that sound, that direction can get really annoying really fast. Or again, in the case of this album, uh, get really unintentionally funny really fast. More power. Uh, uh. There are ideas on this record that I can't believe the band recorded and listened back to them. We're like, yeah, that's that's the one. That's the one, man. <laughs> It took us 20 takes, but we nailed it. Actually, if I found out that this record was like an experiment done in a single take and like nobody actually listened back to it and uh, maybe each band member somehow recorded their respective part separately without hearing the rest of the song, I, I could kind of respect it and see the genius in it. Like, oh, okay, like it, it turned out like that. that. That kind of explains it. Because it does not sound like an album that a bunch of guys making music together for over a decade decade would create without a single one of them stopping at any moment to just be like, hey, you know what? I, I don't know if this is working. <laughs> So yeah, silver lining to this cloud, and that silver lining is that even though this record is the worst of the year, it still managed to be kind of entertaining and you know outlandish in its own special way, in a way that I absolutely cannot take serious, but you know, still, still a way. And I think that's going to be it. That is my top ten worst albums of the year. Thank you very much for watching. Mwah. Anthony Fantano, 2023 list week. List, list and listin. I'll see you in the next one uh, forever.